Okay, yeah, I can only briefly summarize my reasons for concluding there is no God, and I can only cover a few of them. I obviously don't have a lot of time to go into full detail. There are many more I could go on, but these are the big ones. The first is, and I've even mentioned this already in the course of the debate, is the historical trend in discovered explanations. Uh, if we go way back 2,000 years ago, we had explained all kinds of things with God did it. Uh, God exists because lightning struck this person. We have lightning, the weather, disease, the organization of the solar system, the origin of complex animals. We, all of these things we thought God explained them. But in the actual historical trend has been that we found that those ex hypotheses were false. God doesn't cause lightning. God is not responsible for the weather. Uh, God is not responsible for the organization of the solar system. We can explain all of these things in terms of actual natural causes. And this, to me, is a testable theory. This is, we're, we're looking at a test of a theory. So far, the God hypothesis has no testable predictions. You can't start from God and then predict something is going to be observed and then go and see it, except when the predicted observation is exactly what naturalism also predicts. So, for example, in atheism, we have the same thing where, uh, where we say it's not God. If you take any particular thing, lightning, disease, and so forth, we say it's not God versus it is God. The it's not God hypothesis has won out every time. We've proved it's correct. So we can come up with a thousand examples of where the it's not God hypothesis has been verified. And we can come up with a thousand examples where it, the it's God hypothesis has been refuted. And what I see is that it, the trend over history is uh, when you get, you know, if you've, got this, you've got two horses in a race, one wins a thousand races every single race it's ever won, and the other horse has never won any of those thousand races yet. And any particular remaining questions that, that there are where we, we can't explain something, you're going to put those two horses up against each other again. Which horse are you going to bet on? Obviously, you're going to bet on the one that's, that's won every thousand of its races, and, the one that, and you're not going to bet on the one that's lost every race it's ever run. So even when we come to all the things we can't explain yet, I'm looking at the trend. And the trend is making a very high prior probability that what we're going to see is the explanations will come out as naturalism rather than theism. Now that in and of itself wouldn't be sufficient for me, but there are other evidences as well. And in fact, that one particular piece of evidence could be refuted if these other things were actually resolved. And the second one that I'll point to is what's called divine silence. Uh, basically, to put it bluntly, all God has to do is talk to me. I mean, it's quite simple. Uh, if he shows up one day at my house, I'll definitely make time for him, no problem. Uh, he can do it with an apparition, he can send an angel, it doesn't matter. Uh, all he's got to do is talk to me himself. Yeah, there's certain, I've got questions. Uh, I mean, if, there's, if he wants me to believe, there are certain things that need to be answered, that deeply need to be answered, and I would love to you know, pick his brain on that and see what his answers are. Now, that to me is another test. You know, if God wants me to be saved, if God wants me to believe in him, if God even gives a damn about me at all, People who want to save me, people who give a damn about me, they talk to me. They come over and, and you know, give me a talking to, have a conversation, will answer my questions. So all God has to do is come to me and explain the gospel himself. There's nothing really stopping him from doing that. I welcome him if he would do it. Now, we can test this on a larger scale, and that is something we've also brought up with the census divinitatis. Uh, if God were to behave this way, as, I, as it, it, the whole God hypothesis predicts he should, he should have been doing this with everyone all the way back throughout history. We should have records going back to you know, ancient Chinese shaman talking about, yeah, God preached to me the gospel back then even. We would have agreement on the records of God being a nice guy and just chatting with people and telling them what they need to know to live a good life and uh, to gain salvation, the things he wants for them. So this is a prediction that, that the God hypothesis makes, in my view. Uh, the fact that the prediction doesn't bear out is one of the refutations of the theory. Whereas the atheist hypothesis predicts that what we should have is not this, but complete disagreement over history, men making up religions, thousands of man-made religions. That's what atheism predicts. That's what we observe. So in both cases, in the first issue and this issue, atheism predicts something, and that's what we observe. Theism predicts something else, and that's not what we observe. Now another one is divine inaction. Uh, now I think there's a lot of like excuses made for why God doesn't do anything, but I think certainly God ought to protect the innocent from either the evil of men or the evils of nature. And I have a particular story about this. Uh, there's one famous case that's often cited for uh, parents to be very cautious about the handling of meat. There was a particular case where uh, his, this kid's parents were preparing hamburgers for, for eating, and there was a little piece of hamburger that hadn't been cooked that was sitting on a counter, and the parents were busy, obviously, as they, they can't keep your eye on your child every single second of every day. He grabbed that piece of meat and ate it. Well, he got E. coli poisoning, and he was dead within two hours. Even despite having rushed him to the ER, they provided all modern medicine possible, he died, nevertheless. Now, it seems to me this is unconscionable behavior, 
to allow that. Now you can explain why the, the parent might have allowed it because you know they, they, it's not possible, it's not their fault, they couldn't keep track of it. They probably could have been a little more uh, conscious about keeping that away from their children and so forth. But nevertheless, God is a moral agent who doesn't have those excuses. He's not frazzled, he's not limited in resources, he doesn't make mistakes, right? If you, this is another testable theory. If you put a moral agent in a room and no moral acts occur in that room, you've pretty much refuted the existence of that moral agent. You can't say there's a moral agent in that room and not everything that you would predict a moral agent would do by definition or what a, what a moral agent is never happens in that room, then you can conclude that moral agent isn't there. And of course, atheism predicts that there is no moral agent there, which is a great explanation for why there is no moral acts occurring. And I think it would have been very simple for God to basically stop that child and go, oh wait, you shouldn't eat that piece of meat. And, and if you might not be able to understand why now, but you shouldn't do it. Or he could physically move the piece of meat. I mean, there, there are certain things that God could do that certainly I would do. And the basic point is I can't be more compassionate than God. Certainly if God is less compassionate than me, in fact, so uncompassionate that he just dispassionately sits by and watch, watches a kid eat something that's going to kill him, uh, that to me is unconscionable. Certainly I can't be kinder than God, right? So to me, this is another example of a failed prediction uh, of theism, whereas it's exactly what atheism predicts. Atheism predicts there is no God in the sky to help us out, so we really have to help each other and look out for ourselves. So we need to teach parents, for example, about proper meat handling. Uh, God's not going to do that for us. Now, uh, another example is a little harder to explain. Now, those are the three big ones, actually. The ones I just went over are pretty big. I mean, they, they're pretty simple to explain, but the fact of the matter is, if you could resolve, let me honestly, genuinely resolve them, not with excuses, not with uh, you know specious reasoning, not with uh, assumptions and so forth. If you could actually demonstrate all of those things, if the world worked differently, if God were talking to me, if God were helping kids out, if God were acting like a moral agent, if the historical trend were different, if we actually had uh, more confirmations of supernatural phenomena, then I would be a believer. It's quite simple. But I'm going to continue. I'm going to give you another example. This one's a little harder to explain, so it takes a little longer to go through it. The universe itself looks more like an undesigned mess than something that an intelligent engineer would produce. And let me give you an example and let me explain why. I mean, these are the facts. The facts we know are we are conscious beings and we exist. For whatever reason, whatever the causes are, we can at least all agree that we exist and we're conscious beings. And the universe is as science has observed it to be. We all pretty, most people in here, I think, assume that if science has you know, sussed particular fact about the universe, that's the fact of the universe. For example, you know, heliocentrism is for another example. Um, the size of the universe, the age of the universe, and so on. Now, given those two facts, the universe does not appear well designed for life because 99.999999% of the entire universe, all huge sides of it, is ra lethal radiation-filled vacuum. It's not hospitable to life at all. In fact, the, the number of places in this universe where life can live is so small that if you were to put them all into one place and, and inside, if your house was a scale size of the universe and you were to put that one little uh, total, all of the places where life could live and you put it in your house, you would never find it. It would be submicroscopic, it would be that small. And you wouldn't normally conclude that the house was built for that submicroscopic speck, whereas the rest of the house is completely lethal to everything that lives on that speck. Generally, we're running out of time. Okay. So uh, you, can, you can talk about that. There's many other facts like that. Uh, regarding how the universe doesn't appear very well designed for life, ultimately. And um, whereas atheism predicts that the only way we could exist is if the origin of life was an accident and we evolved through natural selection. That the only way we can be, uh, or life could have originated by accident, is if it was extremely improbable. And the only way an extremely improbable event could happen by accident is if the universe were really, really huge and really, really old and had tons and tons of stars in it, billions and trillions of solar systems, so that there's so much in it that very improbable things are going to happen naturally, and yet that's what we observe. We observe ourselves in this gigantic universe, billions and trillions of star systems in it, very, very little life, therefore life is very infrequent. By definition, infrequency is improbability. Therefore, the fact that life is improbable is answered by the huge size and age of the universe. Atheism therefore predicts, it entails, the only way we could exist is if we existed in a gigantic universe, you know, billions of light years in size, billions of light years in age, trillions of uh, uh, solar systems. Atheism entails that that's the only universe we could find ourselves in, and lo and behold, that's the universe we find ourselves in. Whereas God could make any universe he wanted. He can make a universe that was completely 100% hospitable to life. So once again, that's not the universe we observe. So the test is failed. Atheism is confirmed.